back to the ADP Nearshore PMP study group. My name is Dennis DeCosta and I'll be facilitating today's web session on project time management. Let's jump over to slide number two. So what is project time management? Essentially it's all the processes involved in managing the timely completion of your project. You'll notice throughout all the different uh, process groups that we have listed only two process groups contain processes for project time management. That would be planning and monitoring controlling. Okay, so let's jump right on into our first process in the planning process group. So for project time management, our first process is to plan schedule management. So you've already become familiar with some of the other knowledge areas and their first process. Usually that's planning how you're going to handle that particular knowledge area. So it's no different with schedule management. Here you're going to document um, the policies, the procedures, the methodology or approach to handling um, the schedule. Um, it could be uh, a, at, in, at the early stages of the planning, it could be um, kind of broad and it could, uh, or you could get down into um, a very detailed um, level of exactly how you're going to manage it because it's important to note that you know early on in your project you don't have all the pieces put together yet when you're in the planning stage so uh, one thing to note is when you get to plan schedule management it it's probably a really good thing that you've already completed um, the planning for your scope, but it's, uh, you know, it's something that you can begin to document your approach, the methodologies, the tools and techniques that you're going to be using for handling your schedule. Your second process under the planning group is going to be define activities. Define activities is the process of identifying and documenting the specific actions that are going to be required in order to create your project deliverable. So, um, it, you know, when we go back and think about the scope management area and we were creating the scope baseline, which includes your project scope statement, your work breakdown structure, and your WBS dictionary, that work breakdown structure is going to play a critical piece in defining your activities because you need to know what are those work packages, those different elements that you created in your work breakdown structure so then you can decompose those and identify exactly what are the activities or actions needed to complete that work package. Your two primary key outputs of this define activities um, process is going to be your activity list and your activity attribute list. So our third process in the planning group for project time management is sequence activities. So you're going to begin to notice, especially when it comes to uh, the planning area for project time management, there, there really is a logical order that flows between these processes. So first, we put together um, the methodology, documented our po policies and process and procedures for creating um, our schedule. Then we took a peek at our work breakdown structure took those elements and defined out all the activities to complete those work packages. Now that we've got that activity list, we're going to begin sequencing those activities in logical orders. We got to pay very close attention to the dependencies behind these different activities, meaning one activity can't begin until the next, next one has been completed. 
or um, it, you know, there are certain um, uh, certain relationships between activities where we can do them all together at the same time, but we can't move forward to the next step until we've completed one or two other activities. So sequencing is really important about creating uh, logical relationships and the dependencies. So you have predecessors and you have successor activities. Your key output here in sequence activities is going to be your project schedule network diagram. So really, what is that? That's a, it's a graphical representation of all the activities on your activity list in a logical order from start of the project to end of the project when you have your deliverable completed. So moving on to slide six, there's a couple of uh, um, key words that I want to make sure that you're aware of because you're going to see them. Um, you'll, you'll see them in your PMBOK guide. You'll see them on some of the tests and you're definitely going to see that. Uh, you're, you're going to see these words used in your exam. Um, there's mandatory, discretionary, and external. We're talking about dependencies here, types, classifications of dependencies. So mandatory is also known as hard logic. So let's, uh, here's an example. Um, you're building a house and you want to put in the plumbing. So before you can actually have the plumber on site and do the installation of the pipes, you have to purchase the copper pipes. Let's say it's copper plumbing. So first step would be purchase copper pipes. Second is go ahead and install those copper pipes. You, that's mandatory. You have to purchase those pipes. You have to have the material before you can install it. So that's a mandatory dependency. So that activity of purchase has to come before the activity of the installation. Then we also have uh, a, a discretionary dependency. That's also called soft logic or preferential logic. So that is, it's not required to have one activity done before the next. So you could slide that activity in between a couple of other activities to get it done. Um, then finally, we have external. So external dependency is something that's out of your control. You can't, it, it's not part, it's out of the control of the project team. So um, it's not, uh, something that you need to schedule your activities. Um, it doesn't have a dependency um, between the activities your team is going to perform. It could be an activity coming from an external, external source, but it's not an activity that your project team is going to be um, um, handling. So it's out of your control. Now on to your fourth process. This is estimate activity resources. This is going to be where you've got your project schedule network diagram already outlined and now you've got to look at each of those activities and identify, okay, what resources do I need? Resources could be human resources, how many people do I need, what type of people I'm going to need there, or it could be equipment as well. Let's say you're going to be um, doing, uh, you're, you're going to clear out the land because you're going to build a house there. So in that step, you need to make sure you've got your backhoe there, you've got your heavy machinery to, to do whatever it is that activity is going to require. So in estimating activity resources, you need to understand um, how many people, what types of materials are going to be needed, and how, how is that going to affect your durations and um, work efforts? Um, so for example, if uh, we're going to um, get a backhoe and we're going to dig the ditches for, let's say, the sewage system of our house, but we haven't gotten um, 
we haven't cleared the trees yet and that's going to take another type of equipment we don't want to have the backhoe that's going to be doing um, digging the trenches for the plumbing there um, before it's even ready for them to do that so uh, you, you know you need to understand what each activity is look at your activity list look at the sequence of activities when are things going to be done to really understand what uh, resources are going to be needed and at what time what time of the process what time within the process of your schedule network diagram will you actually need those particular resources your key outputs here are going to be your um, resource requirement documentation as well as what is called an rbs resource breakdown structure so similarly to your work breakdown structure that um, gave you a graphical depiction of the work packages and um, catalog them in, in the proper order. Um, the same thing is going to happen with your resource breakdown structure. You would do the same thing. They're essentially going to look the same. Um, so it's this is another important element. Um, I'm going to move over to slide eight. There's a couple of things that you need to know. You're going to build upon this information. It's going to become more um, important for you to understand, but I'm going to throw it out there now. Uh, publish estimating data and bottom up estimating. So, public estimating data is, let's say, um, you, you know, you know, for a particular activity, you're going to need a masonry. And, you know, in a good masonry can probably lay around uh, 50, 50 bricks an hour. I, I don't even know if that's, <laughs> that's reasonable, but 50 bricks an hour. So when you're estimating resources and you know you need to lay down a thousand bricks because that's, the, that's what it's going to require to build out this uh, maybe retaining wall or foundation, you can begin to estimate the resource amount of time. Well, we're gonna need to have a masonry here for X amount of time because uh, you, let's say, it's just an industry standard. Um, so that public information about resources in general and um, it, whatever data you can find maybe you just went to brickmasonary.com and that's where you got the information so that's kind of that's published data then there's another um, type of estimating which is called bottom up estimating um, bottom up estimating is going to become a little more relevant when you estimate durations and that's in our next process but bottom up es estimating is an aggregate roll up of um, time or resource requirements to give you an overall uh, a bigger picture um, more exact amount of uh, estimation or quantity of something that's going to be needed so bottom-up estimating is going to become um, really important and I just want to point that out now because it is part of your estimate activity resources as well all right, on to our fifth process under project time management. Um, our fifth process under the planning section is estimate activity durations. Here's where we are going to start utilizing some math. So get your calculator ready because we do have a couple of uh, samples that I want you to go through um, in the next slide or so. So with planning estimate, uh, activity durations really you're going to look at that particular activity and calculate how much time is it going to take for you to get that done so remember we talked about that uh, um, published data um, published estimating data that information you can you can get because it's it's public it's published information um, it could be information that you already have from previous projects within your organization or it could be stuff that you found online or industry standard information but you're going to use that stuff to really calculate okay exactly how long is it going to take for us to do this how long is it going to take for this particular activity so there's a few different uh, um, key things here that you're really going to need to understand and it's really terminology based you need to understand the term 
you need to understand when it's used and the, the benefits behind it and be able to compare them. So analogous estimating, that's, that's kind of a form of expert judgment. You're really, um, take, you, you don't know much about what's going um, a particular activity or how it's, how it's performed. So you're giving it, um, you know, a, a ballpark figure. It's definitely not accurate. The, it's not the most accurate, but it, it, it's it's close. It's it's it may be good enough for um, the estimate duration process at this point in time. You know, so a key word. Remember, progressive elaboration. As things become more clear, you begin to hone in and define things a little better. Same thing here. Um, so an at, at analogous estimating. Uh, is is really not the most accurate um, and you're just using your expert judgment on that. Then we have parametric three-point and bottom-up estimating. Remember bottom-up estimating is the most accurate. That's where you're really um, you, you know you're taking an aggr aggregate time, aggregate um, calculations, adding them all together to give you uh, your particular duration for an activity or for your project in general. There's some other terms here, heuristic and standard deviation, and uh, uh, and and we're we're going to go into some formulas in just a second. But heuristic is rule of thumb. You're going to see that word. You probably heard it before. You know the word. I'm pointing it out because for some reason it's an important word to know when it comes to. Uh, um, our PMBOK guide and the exam, you will see it on the exam. Um, standard deviation. So this one's a, a, a little more um, complex in nature. The good thing is um, when it comes to the exam, you're really not going to have to do much of the calculations around um, standard deviation. There, there are some um, simplistic forms of the calculation that we will um, get into in just a second, but you really need to know what the percentages are for sigma, S particularly what a six sigma is. Six sigma, 99.9. .9. You've got uh, three sigma, which is 99.7. One sigma, 68%. So it's always best to have a six sigma, but you'll find questions where they're asking you, um, uh, let's say uh, the threshold for this project uh, and, or these activities and, or your schedule needs to be within um, three sigma. So you know if they say three sigma, they want it to be 99.7% within that threshold. Okay, so there's really, um, there. Uh, you're not going to have to um, take out some long equations to do all this stuff. It's the math is kind of simple, and um, we're going to jump onto our next slide. And this is going to uh, kind of give you a little bit of um, exposure to your first set of math questions. All right. So on slide ten, you're going to need to know some formulas. The formulas are really basic, but there's a lot of them. They're all basic. But there's a lot of them. So not only are you going to have to know your 10 knowledge areas, your five process groups, your 47 processes, the key inputs, tools, techniques, and outputs for, for them, or at least understand why some of those inputs, tools, techniques, or outputs belong to a process, but you're also going to have to know some formulas. So when it comes to uh, calculating the schedule and identifying, okay, you know, how quickly could we get something done or what, trying to identify the timeline of events or for a particular activity, you're going to have an optimistic approach, a most likely approach, and then a pessimistic approach. So optimistic means like, I think we can get this done. For example, if we look at the slide, task A. I think we can get task A completed in two days. Most likely, it's going to be three days. Worst case scenario, pessimistic, it's going to be six days. So given that information, 
there's some calculations, some information that we can pull out from this. Looking on your, on your slide, we have what's called the PERT formula. Okay, um, PERT is pessimistic plus four times most likely plus your optimistic divided by six. Then we have a standard deviation formula that you're going to need to have memorized. That's your pessimistic time minus your optimistic time divided by six. And then when we want to talk about a variance to your standard deviation, we're going to take the standard deviation formula and square it. Okay, so now given the information that you have on screen, go ahead and pause your video right now and take a moment and try and calculate these out based on the formulas that are on this slide. We'll have the answers in the next slide. So here's your chance. Pause your screen now. Okay, hopefully you've taken the time and you've solved the problem. On slide number 11, we have the results. So when we do our calculations, um, you know, it's always important to go back, check, double check, triple check, because uh, when you're taking your exam, you're going to have either um, a standard calculator on, on your computer that you'll have access to, or that will give you a tiny little uh, calculator. There's no scientific, no, um, you know, it's non-programmable calculators. It's just a very basic 10 key type calculator. So you're gonna have to understand how to punch this in to your calculator. So get used to doing it, get used to correct, checking your work and making sure it's done correctly. All right, so hopefully you got those right. Any questions, make sure you throw them up on our discussion board and we can go through those during our in-person discussion class. Okay, folks, so now we're on slide 12. We're in the sixth process under the planning group for project time management. This is where we're gonna develop the schedule. We're gonna combine all the different processes that we put together and really come up with our schedule baseline, um, get our project schedule put together, get our resource calendar, and have all the information that uh, really help us to outline exactly the timetable for our project. Um, now, in the real world, we have um, tools at our disposal, like Microsoft Project. You can input some um, information. It's going to print out and pop out your schedule. But for the purposes of the exam and to be a project management professional, um, PMI wants to make sure that you have a solid understanding of how to um, create this schedule, develop this schedule on your own and do this manually. Um, so yes, there are tools that will be your friend in the real world, but for the, for the exam, you're going to need to know how to do this stuff on your own. Um, so let's move over to slide 13. There are a few things that are must knows. You're going to need to know um, how to calculate the critical path, you're going to need to understand what the critical path the, it is and what it means if um, tasks are delayed that are on your cli cli uh, critical path um, and that uh, it will delay your project. So critical path is very important. Critical path is the longest path that has the longest amount of time which in return means at a minimum, this is the minimum amount of time it's going to take to complete your project. Now you can have all sorts of tasks going on and um, they're done at different times and some may take week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and one task may take multiple weeks that maybe 26 weeks. So the tasks that follow that critical pass to complete that deliverable, if they're the longest, really that is the longest for your critical path. So there's, you know, it, it's, it's helpful to look at this from a visual standpoint. So I do have some slides and 
uh, there are some activities that we will be assigning you to help you get a better understanding of that. Also, total float. Um, you may hear float, it's interchangeable. They may call it slack, or they call it float, but really that is the amount of time that you have that's leeway between getting a pro, um, an activity done and getting your next activity done. So, you know, it, it's an activity that's gonna take a couple of days to get done and you've scheduled five days. You know, if it only takes two days, you've got a float of three days to really um, get something done before you start impacting anything else. Now, when we, when we talk about float and that leeway time, um, when you're talking critical path, there's zero float on your critical path. So there's some calculations for um, understanding, you know, what's the earliest you can start, what's the latest you can start, what's the, the latest you can finish or the earliest you can finish a particular activity. And that stuff really helps you um, understand the activities and the timing behind getting them done and um, you know, if you've got some flexibility. So if you get in a pinch, it's really important to know what your float is, what the total project float is, what the, the float for um, particular activities are, because that really helps you stay on top of making sure that you can orchestrate your schedule to ensure you complete your time, your, your project in a timely manner. Okay. All right, on slide 14, I have a, a little exercise here that is ripped straight out of your head first, your head first book. If you don't have it in your attachments uh, for this week's uh, discussion, we do have um, a complete uh, um, workbook doc document that walks you through how to calculate um, your critical path, how to calculate um, uh, the, the float, um, to perform a forward pass and to perform a backward pass. We'll get into those in a moment, but this slide on slide 14 is really um, just a, a quick exercise for you. Um, and uh, it's asking for you to identify what is the critical path, um, what's the duration of the critical path, and how many paths are there. You'll notice some activities, and they're listed by the alphabet, activity A, B, C, G, D, E, F, H, and I. Um, some of those activities may overlap and become their own pathway. So it's, it's pretty obvious with A, B, C, and G that that's one path. But when it comes down to activity D, there's D goes into E, and D also goes into H. So you have two pathways there that are, are two pathways that start with activity D. So you've got D, E, F, and G. Remember, G is part of the first pathway, but it has a task that needs to coincide with the D, E, F pathway. So you can see from here, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one of the answers. There are three pathways here. You need to calculate the duration of each of those activities on each of those pathways to um, understand what are the, the amount of time that that path is going to take and understand which one's the longest because that will be the minimum amount of time required to complete that project. And that minimum amount of time to complete that project is going to be your critical path. Okay, so hopefully on slide 14, you've um, taken some time to uh, complete that activity. Um, so if you haven't, just press pause, um, figure out what the critical path is, um, do the calculations, make sure you understand how to do that, um, the calculations, and then move on to the next slide, which is slide 15. So we're still in develop project, we're in develop the schedule. There are some additional must-knows that really are going to help you um, with your exam. Uh, there's um, compression techniques, resource optimization techniques, then there's critical path, which you've got a little exposure to in the previous exercise on slide 14, and there's critical chain method. So quickly, I'm gonna start from the bottom and work my way up on this slide. The critical chain method is 
really all about um, adding in buffers to your activities. So you have activities that go across your um, project uh, schedule network diagram. You can throw in some buffer activities that kind of help pad the schedule so you have some time to um, recoup. If something starts to go a little over, the schedule's slipping a little bit, you've got those buffers. So when you're using the critical chain method, you're really um, focusing on where your buffers are, how much time your buffers have remaining, where you can apply some of that, that uh, time span within your buffers to um, uh, tasks that may have slipped or um, where you could potentially, if you run into some um, issues. Now, the critical path, we, we understand that. That's where you're looking at your early starts and finishes, identifying how much float time um, could you maybe delay or um, uh, push out doing an activity and uh, recouping some of that time with another activity if need be. So let's, let's go up to resource optimization techniques, resource leveling and resource smoothing. So, you know, those, those are some key definitions that you really need to, to look at. I advise two things. Check your lexicon, your PMI lexicon, which is your dictionary of all these project management terms. Read that and apply some focus to that while you're reading the PMBOK guide because those, those are important um, techniques that can be used you just need to know the difference between them. And then finally up on top, schedule compression techniques. Those are extremely important. So um, on the exam, you're, you're not gonna have to uh, calculate how to crash um, uh, resources um, for activities on your schedule, but you are gonna have to understand um, which activities will give you a, the most bang for your buck if you happen to crash them. I do have an additional video that I'll be sending out on Tuesday, on the night of our discussion for you to follow up and, and watch, and it'll walk you through how to do crashing. But crashing, really, it's applying additional resources um, to an activity that wasn't originally scheduled um, for uh, you didn't originally have those resources scheduled to help you get through um, that activity. Um, there's a couple of things to remember. Crashing, it could have an impact on the cost of that particular activity um, and a cost, a, an impact on the overall project cost. And then finally, it does have some it could potentially have some risks involved in that. You'll get more into that when you get to risk and understanding um, project risk management, but just know crashing, it could have an impact on your cost and could have potential risks. Finally, it's fast tracking. Fast tracking, think of that as like um, taking what was normally a sequential uh, group of activities and maybe having a couple of those activities occur at the same time. So you're going to fast track them. Instead of um, having activity two um, and then activity three begin after two is done, maybe it's okay to have two and three start at the same time. So they're working in parallel. Um, that's that's really what fast tracking is, is all about. And you'll need to know those schedule compression compression techniques, when's the best approach to use them, what's the risks involved with them, and also you'll need to know a little bit about the resource optimization techniques as well. All right, on slide 16, we're going to talk a little bit about forward pass and backward pass. Doing the forward pass helps you identify your early starts and early finishes. Your backward pass is to help you identify your late finishes and your late starts. So essentially you're trying to see, okay, how, how much float time do we have for this particular activity? How much time between um, uh, this activity starting into the next activity can we wait in order to get that activity completed. So you may have uh, an activity, like for example, if we're looking at activity A and activity D, you know, A needs to be completed 
and then you can start D when we look at that particular pathway. However, there's some time between A and D that other activities need to take place before you can actually start D. So really, you know, once you've finished D or activity A in two days, that's all it's going to take for you. Now, completing activity D, you don't even start that till day 11. So when we look between activity A and activity D, we could really hold off on starting activity A until, let's say, the seventh uh, or ninth day of um, the project. Because if we wait, if we start on day one of our project, we will finish task A in two days. But we can't start task D, which is the successor of task A, until um, we've already completed task C. So really, you know, if we're looking at on the 11th day, we need to start task D, we don't really have to start task A until day nine because it only takes two days to complete task A. So, you know, that's, that becomes helpful in, in really managing your schedule um, because now you see where you have some flexibility. You can see where you don't have flexibility as well. So forward pass and backward pass is what's gonna help you calculate that. And we do have a separate video that we'll be sending out after our Tuesday night instruction that's gonna show you how to, how to calculate this. But I'm sure if you follow along um, on, on your own time, you'll be able to see how we came up with that early start, early finish date. There are some rules in place for it. Um, so my advice is to always start with doing your forwards and backwards pass based on your critical path. Um, you can identify your critical path after you've completed your early start and early finish and your late start and late finishes, but you've seen in your previous slide, you can just, you can find your critical path by just calculating the pathway and the days that it takes to complete an activity. So, um, one note is you will have to do this calculation on your exam. They're going to give you um, kind of a, a grid that's going to show you, okay, activities A, B through F. And they're going to tell you that activity goes into this activity. Or they'll say activity A, B, C, D, E, all the way to whatever. It'll tell you that activity cannot start until this other activity is completed. They're going to give you... Um, just a grid that shows you this information and they're going to tell you how many days it is. You're going to have to draw this stuff out. You're going to have to look, it says activity A is followed, um, next comes activity B and D. So you'll have to draw out A, create that box, and then B and D and draw the arrows to it. You're going to have to do this on your own in order for you to then be able to calculate your early start, early finish because they could give you this grid and they could be asking for task G, what's the total float? So you will have to recreate this uh, diagram in order to get your calculations done. So it's going to take a lot of practice. Practice, practice, practice. You're going to need to know how to calculate float. You're going to need to know how to calculate um, the critical path and identify the critical path. And uh, you're going to need to know how to uh, um, calculate your early start, late start, early finish, late finish using forward and backward pass. So look for another video on that coming up shortly. Okay, so that wraps up our planning group for project time management. We've um, developed our um, project schedule management plan. We've uh, defined our activities. We've sequenced our activities. We've estimated our um, resources for each activity. We've estimated estimated the durations of our activities, and we developed the schedule. So at this point, the next process group 
for project time management is monitoring and controlling. We're going to pick that up right here on slide 17. Monitoring controlling is a proce process of monitoring the status and um, controlling the schedule. Because remember, our goal is to make sure we complete our project in a timely manner. Um, throughout the monitoring and controlling, you're really going to be focused on uh, analyzing what was planned to what's actually happening. Okay, so there's gonna be some formulas here. I've outlined them for you. Um, you know, if you, you're, as, as you get into cost management, um, you're going to really roll up your sleeves and start focusing a lot on the formulas. So they put the um, table 7-1 on page 224, which is in your cost management. I'm referencing it here because we are going to talk a little bit about um, some formulas. We're not going to do any calculations today. We're going to save that for our um, lunch and learn for math. Um, for PMP mathematics. Plus, you're going to touch a little bit of, about it in the cost um, management uh, knowledge area um, and actually go through some calculations as well. Um, so, monitoring controlling, you're going to be looking at that work performance data. Remember, there's work performance data, work performance information, and work performance reports. So work performance data comes out of your executing. You're actually completing your tasks and you're looking at your schedule and saying, okay, we're on schedule, we've, we've met this task. Um, and you know, with each task, when you get to cost, you're gonna assign dollar values to your tasks. So the, um, to pay for the plumber, to pay for the materials, um, you know, that's going to add a dollar amount to that task. And you'll be able to gauge, okay, well, we're 50% done with completing this task. The plumber has completed 50% of what he was supposed to do. And it cost $100,000 for this plumbing project. And he's 50% done. So, you know, you've estimated he should have, it's, we've earned about $50,000 worth of work activity. So, you, you know, when, we, when we're looking at how much work has been completed in conjunction to our schedule, we can see, are we on schedule based on the dollars that have been spent, the time amount being um, the amount of work left to be done. We can see what our schedule performance index is. So there's a couple of things here that, um, you know, when you get into your PMP mathematics, you're going to understand. But monitoring and controlling is really all about um, looking at uh, what was planned versus what is actually happening. And then, let's say some issues come up or some changes need to be um, considered and the schedule baseline needs to change. Um, any changes to your schedule needs to have an approved change. Approved change, as you remember from your integration knowledge area, have to go through perform integrated control. So, um, you know, look at these formulas. Um, I invite you to look at page uh, 224 in your PMBOK guide. There's a lot of formulas out there. Um, good head start and some side reading is to uh, kind of go through all the descriptions of um, the formulas that are out there. There's more to come with your formulas. I guarantee it. Um, so really, in your monitoring controlling, you're uh, controlling your schedule. And that's pretty much it. So this will wrap up project time management. Um, there are a couple of other videos that, all, that will be sent out to you um, once this chapter is, uh, uh, once you've gone through your discussion um, uh, meeting and that will be on calculating the forward and backward pass um, also on crashing understanding how to select the correct activity to crash those are important for you to know for the exam um, in your presentation handout for this chapter there are your inputs tools techniques and outputs um, you'll see them look a little different in this presentation. That's because what I've done is highlighted those must 
know inputs, those must know tools techniques, and those must know outputs. Very important. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, remember to use the discussion board out on SharePoint. And uh, we'll talk to you next time where we jump into project cost management. Thanks.